All right, everyone, we're going to get started. A good afternoon to all and welcome to RRS Virtual. I am Melissa Radwan, Director of Marketing for RRS. And today we will be examining U.S. University sustainability and recovery activities. First, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. All attendees are muted. We can't hear you, but we want to hear from you. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom navigation bar to submit your questions. Please do not submit questions in the chat box. The Q&A area neatly organizes all of your questions so that we can address as many as possible later in the session. Yes, we are recording. Uh, we will make this available on the RS YouTube channel. Uh, just give us a few days to download and format and then we'll send out an email with a link to the recording. So let's look at today's agenda. The welcome, we've done that. We're off to a fabulous start. So our first speaker will share some highlights from the recently released RRS report on US University sustainability and recovery activities. And she'll also talk about some best practices um, that we're seeing from various schools. Next up, we will hear uh, about the Michigan State University Surplus Store and Recycling Center. This awesome program is focused on reuse, resale, and then recycling, all to divert materials from landfill. Our last speaker will share information about Clemson University's on-campus compost processing, as well as a few other innovative projects they have going on there. And finally, we're gonna gather all our panelists back and have some time for Q&A. So again, be sure to submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom. So our first speaker is Kelly Domino. Kelly is a consultant at RRS with over eight years of experience in solid waste management, sustainable materials management, and resource recovery. Kelly participates on a variety of projects, including University Zero Waste, private corporation sustainability outreach, and trade association product stewardship. She was the lead author of the recently released report from RRS on university sustainability activities. Kelly, thank you for joining us today and it's all yours. Thanks, Melissa. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, hopefully by now you've um, all had a chance to download our recent report um, on the examination of sustainability activities across the country on university campuses. I see that uh, we've put it in the chat box. So if you um, haven't downloaded it, you can find the link there. Um, and I thought I'd just give you a little preview of the report and then kind of talk about what we've been seeing on university campuses today. So why did we look at universities for this report? So typically university waste and recovery programs have been a focus of mine for the majority of my time at RRS. I love that universities are always kind of that proving ground for you know, new and innovative recovery practices. Uh, and there's always such passion behind their programs. So I've, you know, I, I often also get a lot of questions about, you know, how is my university doing? How do I measure up? You know, what does the average school look like? Um, and, and that's, you know, a hard thing to answer, although we see a lot of university programs, like all of us, you know, every university is different in size, type, location. Um, so it's really hard to pinpoint that exact answer, but we thought with something like this, looking at research, you know, that's out there already, um, you know, any public information, the data that, you know, a lot of universities already have, um, it'd be a great opportunity to share that peer-to-peer -peer education for any university um, that, that needs it. Uh, so this report, uh, you know, we wanted to split it up. Um, into a few phases. <laughs> so as you may or may not know, there are about 2,000 colleges and universities in the US. Uh, so this first phase was just looking at about 312 schools. Uh, we wanted to look at schools across the country, urban and rural schools, small, medium, and large. Um, so we randomly selected that first kind of group. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, you know, the assessment questions that I came up with, we wanted to look at, you know, what's already available in terms of information and data. Um, a lot of schools typically track a lot of, you know, their recycling data, composting data, um, and then they like to talk about it. So, so we wanted to utilize what was currently already out there. Um, and then we also used AISHE, um, their STARS program, when we could, um, if it was the most up-to-date, we'd try and include that as well. Um, so the main categories of the report, 
Uh, you know, just as an overview of sustainability programs such as leadership groups on campus, looking at the average diversion rates, average recycling rates and the recycling programs, the composting programs, and then any innovative programs that we found on campuses. So to kind of give you a little preview and dive into the report, um, you know, the first was kind of sustainability as, as a whole. So, you know, we were looking at, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, with climate change being at the forefront of a lot of students' minds these days, um, we wanted to see kind of who's stepping up and who already had something in place. So we actually were really excited to see that a good majority of schools actually have some sort of space on campus already for sustainability. And that's, you know, whether it's a sustainability director, a sustainability office, or any sort of like student group, such as eco reps or a green team or something like that. So we found that just under 60% of schools had either, you know, a sustainability office or a sustainability leader, which was great. Um, we found in, you know, in my experience of working with universities, having any sort of long-term support is really key. You want, you know, university leadership to be on board. You want student champions to be able to make that program a success. They want to be able to talk about it, help educate. Um, and so it's great to have that base. So that was exciting to see as well. So next up, I'll try to answer that the most common question we've gotten, which is, you know, what is the average diversion rate? What's the average recycling rate? Um, and as, you know, as I mentioned, we broke it up, you know, based on size of school and region, um, just because that is the best way for each of you to hopefully look at this kind of data and, and find what's comparable to you. Um, but here you can see the average recycling rate was broken out by region. Um, and I put up a map to kind of help you see what we were classifying as, you know, US regions. But we found that the average recycling rate was about 24%. Now you can see in that chart, it ranges um, and, and very much, which, you know, at first you might say that's, you know, you're expecting something different, but just a few things to keep in mind in terms of, you know, why, why there's such variation in recycling rates by region. <clears throat> and that's just based on a few things. So, uh, you know, the first might be infrastructure. So it really depends on, you know, where the school is located, Recycling programs and composting programs are heavily influenced by, you know, is there a material recovery facility nearby accepting specific things that they need? Is there, are there in markets that are, you know, available to take that material from the MRF? Um, and so that all influences what schools are allowed to, you know, collect um, on campus. And so that's one big, big, big thing that can influence a program. And the second being, you know, what they actually include as their acceptable material and what's included as that calculation. So we found over, over the years that, you know, anywhere from what's calculated in that recycling rate on the West Coast might be completely different than what's calculated and accepted in a program on the, you know, in the Southeast. So, um, you know, some schools might include C&D or construction and demolition waste, scrap metal, you know, anything like that that might be really heavy can really, you know, cause the numbers to, to go down or up depending on what's included. So, um, so that's just something to keep in mind as well. But um, you can see that, you know, it did range pretty greatly, but, you know, average being 18% to um, about 32% being the highest. And so the last little piece I thought I'd, I'd talk about was innovative programs. So I mentioned at the beginning, you know, the exciting thing about sustainability practices on universities. This is just always something new. There is, they take a fresh take on hard to recycle materials and there's always some sort of new idea for, you know, how to deal with that material and adding a program to their, to their campus. So you can see kind of a list here and there's a more detailed list in the report, but, you know, we found, we, we tried to include, you know, kind of some new things that we are seeing. So like I just mentioned, C and D, construction and demolition waste. There's always some sort of renovation happening or a new building being built on campus. So a lot of schools are actually addressing that material and starting C and D recycling on campus. Um, athletic shoe recycling. Um, one big, you know, thing that we found was, you know, dealing with plastics. We all know that's been, you know, in the news. Students are at the forefront of 
you know, that research and, and wanting to deal with ocean plastics and things like that. So we saw a few ban, uh, bans on plastic water bottles, also plastic of aversion efforts. Um, so discounts on drinks, if you have a reusable mug, um, you know, anything from plastic bag recycling or even eco to go containers. So like pl hard plastic clamshells that they can use over and over at their cafeteria. So it was great to see, you know, some of these innovative programs um, happening across the country. So you might be asking, you know, how can this help, you know, me? How does this report, um, what can I do with this report? So my hope is that this report can kind of help answer that question that you might have been answering or asking, which is how do I measure up? So if you look at, you know, the size and the regional breakdown of schools, um, you know, and using hopefully the data you currently have, um, you can use that to benchmark yourself um, within this data. So while it might not be a direct comparison, you can't, there's not necessarily going to be a one-to-one, -one, but you hopefully can picture yourself within those peers based on size and region. So if you read through the report, um, you know, you can really see kind of what's working, what might not be working across the country within schools of your size in your region. Um, and then hopefully utilize, you know, the, this data and these case studies of schools programs to hopefully help you, you know, bring it to your leadership if you're trying to start a composting program on campus and show them that, you know, so many schools <laughs> across the country are currently doing this, what it's what it's doing to their diversion rates, um, things like that. And, and really also hopefully using it to brainstorm, use these innovative projects that, that are listed to really help spark some of your own ideas or you know, just use the bright ideas from your peers to start these programs on your campus. Um, so hopefully that's how you can best utilize it. So what's next? So whether you currently already have successful programs on campus or you're looking to add, let's say a composting program, uh, we all need goals to help us progress. So my first step for you is to have, you know, to set a goal. Um, so what are the stats we found while looking, you know, throughout college campuses across the US was, you know, this trend of setting either a climate neutral goal or a zero waste goal. Um, but you want a goal that's realistic for you. Um, so if you're if you're at 15% recycling rate right now and you set a zero waste goal for the next five years, you know, that's great, but it's it's not necessarily realistic. Um, you want, you know, students to see that they have a goal that's within reach. You want something that they can see progress happening year after year. So hopefully this report can help you see, you know, kind of what others, you know, where other schools are at and where you stand within that and then help make you know, a healthy benchmarking goal. Um, so second, I would say is to check off some of these university best practices. I'll talk about them in a second, but we found, you know, about six key university, um, you know, common practices that are really leading to successful, sustainable, sustainability <laughs> programs. So um, I'll get into those in a second, but um, those are, you know, great places to start. And then lastly, sharing progress. So one of the best things we've seen on campuses is the ability to be transparent. Um, you know, while a campus might set a five or a 10 year goal, you know, you don't wanna just leave everyone guessing for, you know, those five to 10 years. So you want to really share your progress, whether it be quarterly or, you know, by semester um, or at least by year. And to really share, you know, your, your progress with students and staff to show that their efforts are making a difference. You know, it's that connection that students might, you know, see between the seconds that they're spending, hopefully, you know, uh, putting the separate materials into the bins that you've set out, but they're going to be able to show that those actions are actually making progress. So it really helps build, you know, it boosts morale, but it also builds confidence for your program. So lastly, I mentioned these, you know, best practices and you know, I thought before I pass it off to our next speaker, I'd share, you know, what we've seen kind of working, providing assessments to schools across the country, you know, these six common pieces that seem to be, you know, within these successful programs. So the first being, as I've mentioned before, university support and champions. Um, you know, you want to make sure you have, 
you know, an understanding of who those are, who those champions are. Do you have leadership being a university president, a student group, um, you know, really somebody that's going to be through and through helping you um, educate, helping you, um, you know, spread the word um, throughout campus because, you know, sometimes you need just, you know, sustainability office tends to be small on campuses. So you want, you know, that network to help you. Um, second being goal setting. Again, I've mentioned this one before, but it definitely is important. Um, you can't really answer that question of how am I doing if you don't have a starting point and point that you're striving to reach. So set something realistic and make small steps to then reach that goal. But then once you reach it, set a new goal. So you want it to always be something that you're working towards. Third being collection infrastructure. Now this is a huge topic. <laughs> um, but really just take a look at your collection system. You know, we found that the one issue that a lot of schools seem to have is inconsistent bins, um, not having a paired twin bin system. So making sure recycling and trash are always next to each other. And the same goes if you're adding a, a compost program. So making sure everything's consistent, everyone knows exactly what to be looking for when they're, they're disposing of their materials. Fourth, waste contracting. So this is another common issue we found uh, is not just, you know, contracts in general, but waste and recycling hauler contracts. Now, you know, you want something that works for you. And so I'll just say that, you know, a lot of schools tend to not know or, or not think that they can get a lot back from their hauler. Um, and really, they should be able to help you get some of that data. If you can't track it yourself, you should be able to get data from your hauler. And so that's really something that, you know, it's, it's a, a very, um, you know, give and take of, work with your hauler, make sure that, you know, you're getting from them what you want out of your contract, but also making, working with them to make sure you're giving them clean material. So you want, you want to have that working relationship, making sure you're, you're always communicating with them. Speaking of clean material, <laughs> education and outreach. So your education for your program needs to be ongoing. We say it over and over again, it's never one and done. Universities are a place that have an ever-changing population turning over every year um, and community members that constantly are coming to campus. So you need to have something where, you know, anybody that's new to campus knows exactly what those programs, you know, instructions are, what they should be putting at each bin. So make that a priority. And that means signage above recycling and compost bins, making sure if there need to be updated that that happens. Um, making sure, you know, you might have targeted campaigns for specific materials, um, putting up banners, emails, newsletters, always just something so it's top of mind for people. Um, and then last but not least, tracking. So I've talked about this data. We've all <laughs> been talking about this for the last 10 minutes. So making sure that, you know, you know what's going on, you know what's being generated on your campus. So whether your hauler is managing that collection and giving you the data or you're doing this in-house, you really should have an understanding of data and uh, what's being tracked for each building on campus. So have a system in place that you can use year after year after year, and that really can help you then have that, you know, progression. You can show the, you know, the, pros the progress you're making to your students and hopefully you know, be as transparent as possible, as I mentioned before. Um, but that will really help you um, create a sustainable program that you can, you know, have year after year. Um, so those are just, this, uh, you know, some of the key pieces we found from, you know, working with programs. Um, thanks so much for your time. And um, please and go download the report. And I'm happy to answer any questions when the time comes. Thanks. Awesome, thank you, Kelly. And I know there's probably a number of folks on here who are like, yeah, we do that, but maybe we should improve or add to or whatnot. So very grateful that you went over those best practices as well as a quick overview of the report. Um, in the chat, uh, we put a link where you can go directly to download the report. It's free, please go ahead and get that. Um, and then you see Kelly's uh, information right here uh, if you wanna contact her directly. So now we get to the interactive portion of the, uh, the webinar here. We have a poll. Uh, we are going to start with the question, why does your campus have a recycling, composting, or sustainability program? This one you can pick as, uh, I think you pick more than one, um, whichever options or, or option or options makes this most sense. Um, 
and maybe because it's you know active towards sustainability goals, maybe it's part of the curriculum. Maybe students are demanding it. Kelly mentioned something about you know that students are kind of at the forefront. They're the voice, the squeaky wheel uh, that is demanding us uh, to take uh, take action. Community partnership. Maybe the campus is partnering with the local community, um, and so they you you have a program or programs that uh, meet the needs of a collective. Um, and maybe you're a part of the American College and University President's Climate Commitment. Um, and I see a few of you are, but it looks like the vast majority. Oh, it moved again. Okay, no, nope, no, nope, we're still good. Uh, helps meet campus sustainability goals is in the lead here. And I think we'll end the polling for now. And I'm gonna share the results. So our winner is helps meets campus sustainability goals, followed up in second place with student demand. Uh, and then we have community partnership coming in a strong third. So I thank you for being a part of our polling. And I am now, one moment, let me get to our next slide here. All right, we are now going to introduce our next speaker, uh, Chris Jolly. Chris has been at Michigan State University since 1997, where he's held a variety of positions within the surplus and recycling departments, including education coordinator, contract administrator, and sales manager. He currently manages the award-winning MSU Surplus Store and Recycling Center, whose mission is to manage waste as a resource through an integrated system of reuse, recycling, collaboration, and education. The program collects and manages over 30 million pounds of material each year and returns over $3 million in value to the university annually. So Chris, I'm very excited to hear about the Surplus Store and Recycling Center, so take it away. Great, uh, thanks for having me. I've got 10 minutes, so I usually take an hour for this. So I'm gonna talk a little fast. Um, the Surplus Store and Recycling Center uh, is pictured on this slide. It was built in 2009 with an internal loan. Um, that loan, including interest, is about $21 million over 20 years. So about a million dollars a year in debt service payments. Uh, when we built the facility, uh, with the, actually the help of consulting with RRS, um, we merged existing functions of the surplus store, recycling collections and processing, and waste collections and disposal. The driver, the primary driver in its construction was a lack of private recycling company, uh, companies within a close proximity to the Greater Lansing area. It was at least 60 miles to anywhere that would take our material, which made it very difficult um, to expand what we would collect. Uh, we were charged with taking on existing but taking our existing budgets and developing a business model to fund the construction without adding to the general fund. So we had to find that million dollars a year without adding anything to our general fund. Um, in turn, then we weren't supposed to take any reductions, but that's not always reality these days. Um, in my talk today, I'm going to highlight the benefits of our program, our funding model, and the importance of the surplus store and funding waste reduction programming, along with a quick glimpse at what's next. I hope you are all familiar with the zero waste hierarchy. I, I'm sure most of you are, if not everyone. Um, our mission at the Surplus Storm Recycling Center is to manage MSU's waste as a resource, and our programming is rooted in this zero waste hierarchy. We have a robust education and outreach program that works to address the top half of the boxes. And in terms of disposal, we re prioritize reuse over recycling. As we feel, reuse is usually the higher and better use of material environmentally, socially, and economically. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, the two primary features of our facility um, would be our surplus store and our material recovery facility, or MRF, where we sort and process recyclables. Because we own the collection method for waste recycling and surplus, um, we're able to encourage departments to send items to surplus rather than the other two options. Uh, we regularly monitor both trash and recycling to provide feedback to customers about items that could be reused. When in doubt, we ask departments to send it to surplus. As a result, when we do our waste sorts, there's less than 1% in our waste stream that could be reused, which is pretty impressive. Uh, our store processes about 40,000 items per week and generates between three and $3.2 million annually. 
50 to 60% of that revenue is returned to departments who send us the items. These are usually higher dollar items or items with a large quantity or where we have a special agreement with that customer. Uh, we actually make the bulk of our income off the nickel and dime items that are a lot, uh, that a lot of programs deem too cheap to deal with. For example, our state surplus program has a floor of $300. If it's worth less than that, offices are encouraged to throw the item away or arrange their own donations for it. And that's just not very feasible. And, and in their defense, I mean, our state is very large and it's an eight hour trip to some of their offices. So it's their expenses are wrapped up in hauling. So, but I, mean, I think you could get more creative with how you would sell that material and generate revenue. Our store operates a storefront that you can see in the picture. Um, and then we also have an online store, the MSU surplus store.com. We sell on eBay and Amazon. Um, have been selling on eBay for almost 15 years uh, without issue. It's been very beneficial for our program and our online store keeps growing. Finally, I'd like to say our MRF processes between eight to nine million pounds of recyclables annually. That's been going down over the last three or four years because as curbside single stream recycling becomes more readily available, we're not seeing as much stuff coming to our public drop-off centers. And campus waste has been going down as well but in turn, so is recycling. So they've been falling at the same rate. I don't know if that's just because everything is lighter because it's plastic or, or where that's coming from. We haven't been able to figure that out. Our recycling is collected from over 500 facilities on campus, as well as our public drop-off center at our building and with outside of all of our apartment complexes. Next slide. I realized I doubled up on pictures here, I apologize. Uh, the benefits of our program, we provide a tremendous benefit to the local community. If that top left picture where you see all the people um, don't wanna show our fire marshal that picture because it got a lot busier than we anticipated. We collected items throughout the year, um, low value office supplies, things that we typically have a hard time selling through the surplus store. And we promote a teacher sale. Um, by sale, I mean, we give it all away for free. And then in turn with that teacher sale, we also have a sale throughout the rest of our store. And this one day event, we generated over $25,000 in sales for us. We moved a bunch of these low value office supplies that typically we were challenged with. And most importantly, it was greatly appreciated by teachers throughout Michigan. We've done two of those, looking forward to getting back to them. We do lots of different types of events like that. We do an annual holiday sale. We do big bike sale events because we impound over a thousand bikes a year on campus and different activities like that. Um, we participate in university organized events like our science festival, um, Grandparents University, um, and that, in those events we connect participants with hands-on educational opportunities on waste reduction. We support research through technical and practical support, including logistics, materials, labor, and more. We're currently supporting over $600,000 in faculty grants with letters of support issued for over $10 million this year alone. I hope we get a couple of those. Um, all of our services are open to the public, including the recycling, the recycling drop-off centers, our classes, our tours, and more. We take electronic waste and other hard to recycle items from the public as well. We collaborate with over a dozen faculty members annually to provide students with hands-on waste sorts, with classroom sessions on reuse and recycling to try to connect the value of recyclables, what's in the waste stream, my favorite, but we still struggle with after 20 years are still half used toilet paper rolls. I'm sure that looks familiar to some of you who've done waste sorts. Um, we can coordinate several on-campus and off-campus large-scale collection events, uh, including a move-out event for our residence halls and apartments. We have between 16 to 17,000 students in our system every year. Uh, we collect about 100,000 pounds of carpeting alone from those events and several hundred futons. Um, I might even say a couple thousand futons. Um, and then we also participate in countywide special collection events. Um, we're in a tri-county area where most people affiliated with campus live in one of the three counties. We do some very large events called Recycle Rama with, with our tri-county partners um, where we divert a lot of material. Next slide, please. We generate revenue for academic and operational departments and all we return over $3 million in value to the university annually. We also provide an important fiduciary responsibility by making sure MSU is maximizing the value of assets purchased with tuition and state dollars. We support alumni relations by providing them an opportunity to own pieces of their alma mater's history, 
the bottom left, you can see a band pillow or a pillow repurposed out of old band uniforms and a kayak paddle that was made from a tree that was taken down on campus. We employ over 70 students in a wide variety of uh, positions. We also provide them with educational opportunities like attending our local or our state recycling conference. We are the last line of defense for data security, ensuring no items leave campus with data on them. Um, as the Internet of Things grows, everything has data on it. We've recently had some treadmills that had student data on it from when they swiped their carts. Next slide, please. Our budget, we have about a six and a half million dollar budget. Uh, Two million of that is general fund. I mentioned before, we, we don't take any additions or subtractions to that, except for this past year due to COVID, we took a 4% cut. Um, our trash bill today is 50% less than it was 10 years ago, despite a 30% rate increase. Any savings on our trash bill get to be applied to our debt service. But the bulk of that debt service comes from our uh, surplus store. So what's next? Next slide, please. Last fall, we completed construction of a hoop house system for vermicomposting. This provides us with an on-campus outlet for managing organic waste and will enhance our educational programming and, and outreach. Finished compost will be marketed and sold through the store. We're going to grow our Spartan Upcycle model where we take items uh, and create new value out of them by creating different items. Uh, we provide classes throughout the year. Um, the best example of this is we pull bottles out of recycling, which is glasses zero value, and we've been able to sell those for anywhere from a dollar to a hundred dollars a piece, depending on the bottle. Um, we're revising, revising our guidelines and transparency around plastic recycling, and then we're going to actually had found some success this past year with selling online only due to COVID, and we're going to expand our online offerings. Finally, in conclusion, our recycling program would not be what it is today without the surplus store. In 1999, we made a commitment amongst two full-time employees and a couple students to manage reusable items as a resource. That commitment has resulted in growing annual sales from $300,000 to over $3 million. Our center was built from funding strategies developed by the surplus store. MSU, like many other universities, spends hundreds of millions of dollars annually on goods and services. The value of this waste produced from the value of the waste produced from this level of purchasing should not be ignored. As many of us in the recycling industry struggle with budgets impacted by a volatile commodities market, reuse can be a stabilizing factor. Thank you. Ah, talk fast. Oh, great job, Chris. I know you're trying to cover a lot there in a very small amount of time, but I truly appreciate it. And I'm sure our audience appreciates it as well. I know we've had a lot of people who have asked some questions about uh, the surplus store itself, either even before the, the uh, webinar started. So I thank you for giving us the inside scoop. And now we're going on to poll number two. And this one is asking you, what is your campus recycling rate? So there are some of you who may not have a recycling program or don't know, those are options on there. And then we've just built some ranges into um, see where everybody kind of fits. Um, so take a good guess if you think you're, you know, the ballpark. It's not scientific, we're not gonna hold you to it. Um, but we just kind of wanted to get a feel for what is out there. Um, and I'm seeing that 16 to 30% seems to be in the lead, uh, followed by 31 to 45% and then 46 to 60%. Um, there's a number of you who don't know, perfectly fine. Um, I'm going to give this just another 10 seconds, so click away if you're debating. Like I said, I'm not going to hold you to it. It's okay. Ballpark it. And three, two, one. All right, I'm going to share the results. And it looks like a majority of those that answered, uh, 16 to 30% recycling rate. Nothing to sneeze at there. But then a uh, close second is the 31 to 45% followed by the 46 to 60. So great job there. Uh, we're gonna have one more poll coming up shortly, but next I want to introduce our final speaker to the virtual podium. Uh, David Haynes is the composting operations manager at Clemson University. He's gonna share some information about their on-campus compost processing and a great deal more, David. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for uh, having me. Uh, this has been already a, a wonderful experience. I'm excited to be, read the report. And uh, actually, I have a report to share with you as well, too. Um, 
when I first started looking into this, uh, I asked to uh, present. Um, I uh, was kind of struck with how much research has gone on through our site. Um, and uh, go to the next next slide, please. Um, yep. Uh, so I just kind of started with the basics of research, which is uh, you know who, what, where, when, and why. And if we can answer those questions, then we'll be able to uh, um, you know move on, progress, and get the answers to all these questions that we have. Um, and as we go through at the end, um, I would like to uh, put a link to the white paper, um, which is really mu a much more in-depth view of our program um, and kind of where we're going. Um, it's actually called the, uh, the future of um, Clemson Organics Recovery. Uh, so as robust as Michigan State's recycling program is, it, it sounds like, it sounds like we've been putting in a good bit of work down here at Clemson. Um, uh, Cherry Crossing Research Center is a facility that was uh, um, supported by South Carolina DHEC, um, as well as the student champions, the staff and the faculty that all supported this mission. Um, actually uh, based out of a, a creative inquiry um, class uh, to see if we could capture and uh, uh, process the material coming out of just one of our um, dining facilities. Uh, so now as today, what we do is we research all methods of composting and organic material re reuse um, through value-added processing. Uh, where we're located in Clemson, um, actually at a repurposed site. Um, they used to bring all the old coal down to Clemson's um, to burn for hot water. And the EPA came in and cleaned this up. And then now we've been using it to process and reuse all the organic waste coming from Clemson's campus, as well as many of the different kitchens around the area, and then our landscape department. Um, we capture all of the organic material, such as uh, wood chips, tree waste, yard waste, um, and we turn that into uh, leaf mold, leaf mulch that gets used back on campus, and then the chips we turn use as our carbon source to create some of the best compost, in my opinion, in the South. So, um, the basics of why, though, is really something that's um, kind of very, very important to to me and many of the students here. And like Kelly said, the getting a student champion. And being able to have that student voice is one of the most powerful tools we can have to start um, start making a change in the world. They're, they are the future. They're the reason why. Um, go to the, the next slide. Um, so as as we've been as I took a look at this, um, again, I said that we have so much going on at Cherry Crossing. Um, we're actually currently in. Uh, a little bit of a changing state. So that's why I haven't really uh, um, shown y'all too much of the site. I really would like for everyone to go and take a look at that paper after. Um, it'll give you a much better idea of uh, who we are and where we're at um, because there's a lot of information. Um, so, but I've kind of distilled it down into the these three, uh, educational outreach, operational proficiency, and product innovation. Um, so for our education, again, it just, it starts with the students. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, we have student engagement at the core of our program, um, where currently we use uh, the UBIC internship program, which they're wonderful uh, group. Um, and those are <laughs> four of our previous interns. Um, they're, they're the people that make the change. They're the people that have the heart and the drive and, and the desire to really make 
every day, go and get that chore, get the, get the bin to site and help make compost. Um, through Creative Inquiry, we have our development. Um, and there have been many ones um, to come through site, a large, uh, large portion of it is focused around reuse and development. Uh, we have had uh, black soldier flies, vermicomposting, um, and I'll get on, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the next efforts past that is our community outreach, because as much as I as operations do with my tractor, I still have another half of the team, which is everybody that puts food in that bin. And that's, there's a number of them because on campus today, we have around 160, 170 bins, um, or not, sorry, not today, um, kind of before COVID peak, um, but we're, it looks like we're getting back close to it. Um, uh, we work with the football and game day cleanup, um, get a lot of our material from there, from large events, because um, there's a lot of extra produced. Um, uh, we also try to use our materials locally. Um, so a lot of our uh, finished compost goes out to usage at, at the various farms. And then uh, some of the local gardens, either student or um, just community-based. Uh, we also work closely with a lot of educational and organization partnerships. Um, we're we're uh, working with the, the Department of Health and the Agricultural Extension because of uh, Clemson's land grant heritage. Uh, it's, a, it's a farm school. Um, and then finally, again, with the EPA, um, we know and, <laughs> and love their work and want to support them um, as much as we can. So go to the next slide. Um, so as far as operational proficiency, um, we're a demonstration site. We have grown from in, in all 10 years. We've used, uh, we started out with the Invesel, um, and then we are currently uh, using our turned windrow pile systems uh, for processing. And then eventually we will be moving to the aerated static pile system, um, which are uh, just different ways of pasteurizing uh, the organic material um, that we use. Uh, we also have a larger number of small scale demonstrations. Um, so I mentioned the black soldier flies. Those are, are a carbonless way of composting that um, you can generally uh, put whatever you want in there as long as uh, it's not got a hard skin and they'll, they'll tear it down. Um, we have a, a small vermicomposting bin, um, NC State, I know, and it looks like uh, Michigan's got a really large one. Um, and then uh, we have a couple of just small demonstration homeowners for anybody who come and take a tour of site. Uh, we also have a lot of training opportunities available um, through the student staff tours and just to go through all the different systems that we have in play and how they can use it at home or participate if they don't have the ability to access composting at home. Um, we also have our UPIC interns who work hand in hand with us and eventually go on to bigger and better. Um, so if you need, actually go on to the next slide, please. Uh, some of our partnerships, and I kind of want to talk about a little bit backwards, but Atlas Organics is what one of the founding members of the program here on campus. Um, and they've grown to a commercial, uh, I think five sites across the Southeast, which is Wonderful. Um, and then we are also getting a lot of support through uh, industry. Um, I think it was a $1.1 million grant that Dr. Melgar had to study uh, fruit growth cover bags. Um, and then we supported him through uh, the actual the, um, setup and study of the decomposition of those bags. Um, he's also working on efficacy of our materials as well as a, a number of different research options so um, I know I'm about out of time so I, I again strongly 
um, suggest that y'all uh, check out the uh, white paper that we've written um, because it, it contains a lot more information um, about our research and about the potential that we have to, to, uh, to grow. So thank you for your time. Wonderful, thank you, David. And uh, David, if you have the URL and could uh, send that over via the chat to Ashley, we can get that up to everyone uh, so they can have quick access to that white paper. So now we have our third and final poll for everyone to participate. And this is a fun one. It's what is on your campus wish list? Um, we try to think of a bunch of different things. We're obviously, we can't think of everything, but, and you can do multiple choices too. So you don't have to just pick one. That would be mean of us. No, you can pick multiples. So what would you want to have on campus? I think there's a couple of in here that are talking about expanding what's already on campus, um, but looking to add to what you already have, um, build upon the successes that you do have. Uh, so it looks like people are actively voting. Okay, we'll, we'll let this one go for, for another 30 seconds here. So I know the list is a little big and I did put an other in there because I can't think of everything. And I know there's some great stuff out there. And Kelly mentioned a lot of those innovative programs that might fall under that other category. Um, and you all are so creative. So let's see here. I'm just gonna give you a little hint. eco to go container seems to be in the lead. Uh, followed up by starting in organics recovery composting. So we got to hear a lot about that with David. Set diversion and zero waste goals. Kelly talked about that, right? It's one of those best practices really can start to drive uh, the momentum, uh, setting some goals, getting there. Okay, I'm gonna give you a 10 second countdown to get your last votes in. And all right, I'm going to end the polling. I'm going to share the results with you. Our winner is eco to go containers, uh, followed by setting those waste diversion goals. And then there's like a five-way tie. Um, but it looks like everyone uh, is is you know expanding, starting. Um, ooh, we got a we got a number that want to start that surplus store, Chris. I think you might be getting a few phone calls. Um, and move in, move out. Chris mentioned that uh, as well. Lots of great stuff that everyone is looking to do. So honestly, that's very encouraging because people want to continue to build upon all of this progress that we have. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our uh, panelists to turn on their videos. I'm going to stop sharing our um, all right, and I apologize, I am just getting things set up. And uh, David, if you could turn on your video as well, we'll get you up here. Awesome. Okay, so let me, I'm going to pull a couple of questions that came directly from our audience. And I think I have a few starter questions that came in via folks who uh, submitted their registrations with some questions. Um, I, actually, Chris, I'm going to start with you and folks, just so you know, I'm looking over at another screen that has all the questions listed for me. Um, does MSU have an abandoned property policy uh, when it comes to the surplus store? Uh, abandoned property goes to our police department and it's held, it's like a lost and found, it's held for 30 days and then comes our way, but we really don't have much in terms of abandoned property besides bikes. And we usually let those sit out for close to a year before we impound them. Okay. All right. Uh, David, I'm going to ask you, are you composting food containers? Because um, I know there's a lot of, you know, compostable containers, and then there's different levels of compostability. Are containers included in the Clemson um, program? Yeah. Actually, we're, we were, uh, right before COVID, we were set to expand our collections um, into it, but then um, as a part of the concern for our students and safety, we decided that we couldn't, honestly, that was the, the one the one reason. Um, we're actively, uh, honestly, looking for partnerships to go ahead and study um, the breakdown. Um, I think there's a program on the, the West Coast uh, already um, that, 
uh, does study and shares the data. Um, I, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, we're, we're actively trying to get that because that's another huge part of our waste stream that we really want to capture and repurpose. Wonderful. Um, Kelly, you mentioned, you stressed the uh, benefit of uh, metrics and tracking and reporting. Uh, is, are there, uh, is there any methods out there that universities are using? Is there like a common way to track um, that you, you've seen with your university? Yeah, so there are a number of, um, we, we, you know, some of the universities that we've worked with, I know have used like retrack or kind of the new, um, you know, variations of that. And a lot of schools do, I, I mentioned um, AISHI, one of the, the large organizations that universities are involved with, sustain, with sustainability, um, a lot track their data and uh, provide that to AISHI. Um, and, and so I would say there are systems out there to help you. Um, but I, at least in our experience, a lot of universities just tend to track in-house and they just come up with some sort of system that works for them um, just because the, it's very, you know, you can have a template, but, you know, as you can tell from MSU and Clemson, every program is different. You're going to be tracking different things and, and you know, whatever is going to work for you might not work for other people. So we've seen a lot more, um, you know, personalized templates be created. Um, Per campus, I would say, yeah. Well, and I'm going to extend that that question over to David and Chris. How how are you guys tracking your your programs? Is there a certain program you're using to do the metric tracking? Excel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that works. Started and then we used uh, Google Docs for a while. I think we're back to Excel for um, just simplicity. Uh, but I know that we've been uh, Marcus has been uh, uh, been working on a web version so that we can just have our students whenever they're out on route, log on and, and have it and maybe even be able to get a fee, uh, more feedback to our students by having a direct display of how much waste is being um, generated. Uh, yeah, it's a, he's, he's doing a lot of uh, good work on the data side of things right now. Yeah. All of our trucks have onboard scales, so our collection software, we run a route, we enter weights as we pick everything up and capture it there. Perfect. All right, um, I'm going to just open this question to anybody who wants to answer. What sort of liability concerns do you have to overcome with your campus efforts, and how do you convene the powers that be that it was worth, worth the initial risk to get it all started? I can speak for MSU. I'm, I'm really lucky that our administration largely ignored us for several years until we started making enough money where they started paying attention. Um, we've only had one accident in 20 years I've been there where we were selling something for another school and it didn't go through our normal process and it had mercury in it. And the guy who bought it wrote a big post about us selling bad stuff. So um, otherwise it's kind of up to common sense. Um, we trust your customers to fill you in. You, you know what's dangerous. Um, just go through your normal process. We haven't had any issues. On our sides, it's just, it's represented as a cost savings. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're diverting. So even if we're not spending the money, that's money that could have been spent. Um, it's one of the, the invisible uh, parts of a budget that people forget to kind of track. Is it, you know, it's kind of the same thing as uh, risk aversion. Um, near miss is still you know, very, very, very important to pay attention to, even if you don't track it as an accident. Um, but in terms of our program itself, uh, we, my neighbors are the uh, the cows and the chickens. So nobody really, <laughs> nobody really um, bothers us or complained about the smell when, when I guess the students were figuring things out. And by the time I came along, um, what we mostly had to focus on was uh, honestly meeting the demand um, is the highest level and then getting uh, getting the community support um, like essentially just changing changing the thought patterns and instead of it being a waste it's a co-product or it's you know it's that's something that we can make something out of it's all the same message you know 
Absolutely. Yeah. Switching the thinking from waste to resource um, is, is key. And I know that's a message that we've been pushing at RRS for quite some time. We have a question for both David and Chris and um, has to deal with food waste. So Chris, I know you use more recycling, but I'm going to throw it at you anyways, in case you, you do have some info. Um, but David, uh, we'll start with you. So what type of in-vessel equipment do you use for processing food waste? Um, that's where our program started. It had, uh, I think this one, hmm, I have to go look up the, the specifics of it, but it's a, it's a nine yard processor. Um, uh, we have a little uh, mix hopper on the front and then loads in on auto, it's automatic. Um, but we quickly outgrew it because you can only take in three yards a day. <laughs> um, and that's uh, about four or five of our cans. Um, we currently use it now for troubleshooting. So for large events, whenever somebody mixes, we, you know, we're with, with every program, there's growth and there's issues. And, and um, so we have to be able to plan for that. And we use our in-vessel for uh, issue processing. So that way it's encapsulated over to the side um, and not contaminating our, contaminating our main stream. Um, and then uh, yeah, so that's that's where that one's at. Okay. And for us, a lot of our food waste goes to our anaerobic digester, um, which we have as part of our farm system. So, yeah. Okay. And we are almost out of time, but I want to give uh, you know about thirty seconds for each of you to just give some final thoughts when it comes to campus programs. And um, David, I'm going to start with you, and then we'll go to Chris, and then Kelly. 30 seconds, all right. Uh, find, find your champions. And honestly, just it, it's showing up every day and being able to say, hey, this is this is what's right. We're, we're going to do this and make it happen. And Chris? I can piggyback on that one. Uh, nobody gave us permission to do what we do. Um, we built our program on our own because we decided one day we wanted to do it. And then we built success, we built trust, we found administrative advocates and, you know, 10 years later, we had a nice new building with six bathrooms when our old building did not have a bathroom at all. So um, just find those advocates. And Kelly? Yeah, and I'll just say, um, I think, you know, this is a great example of, I think, just communicating with your peers. I think one of the things we, um, you know, we saw when we were doing the research for the report was that, uh, you know, a lot of programs like to share their information and, and kind of hear from other from other campuses and, and, you know, kind of seeing what other people are doing. I think that's the one thing I, again, I love about universities is they always want to know what the other person's doing. And I think it's just part of that education. And so, um, you know, when we come in to hopefully get everyone on a campus to be at the same table to communicate among departments, it's, it goes the same way with other campuses, I think you know, making sure you kind of are knowing what's going on elsewhere and, and see how you can bring it to your own campus. So. Well, that is all the time we have for today. And I would like to thank our panelists for sharing their great information and programs with us today. And I want to extend a thank you to our audience for joining us, participating in those polls and submitting insightful questions. You'll see an email coming from RRS within the next few days with a link to the recording and an option to schedule a few minutes to talk one-on-one -on -one with Kelly, or Nicole Chardoul, who is our Vice President of RS and Resident Organics Recovery Nerd. <laughs> but uh, if you wanna talk about your campus and what you're trying to achieve, feel free to schedule appointments with um, Kelly or Nicole. There'll be a link in that email. But on that note, I wish everyone a great rest of your day. Stay safe and healthy.